everyone. Thank you very much for coming out. Uh, it's a very busy week and we appreciate your attendance here this evening. Uh, I'm Lisa DiBartolomeo and I coordinate the Slavic and East European Studies program, which is why you're getting pierogi. You're probably wondering why you're getting pierogi. Uh, but part of the purpose of this entire lecture series over the course of the semester is to commemorate the 100th anniversary since the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1917. But rather than focusing only on Russia and only on 1917, we wanted to expand outward and think beyond 1917, think beyond the boundaries of, of Russia or the Russian Empire, and think about revolution more broadly. So we've had some wonderful uh, speakers over the course of the semester. We had Cindy Buckley from the University of Illinois who talked to us about LGBTQ issues in Russia today. Uh, last week we had Christina Olson from the CAC talk to us about Russian avant-garde art, and that was fantastic. Rhonda, you missed it. And uh, last night we had Dr. William Brewstein who talked about interwar fascism and anti-Semitism. And in two weeks, I've got some flyers over there, uh, in um, actually November 13th, we have an amazing private concert by Dr. Michaela McTeer and Dr. Diego Gabete, who will be playing violin for us because that's how cool we are. Uh, and at each one of these events, you get a button. And do you want me to tell you what you get for the violin concert? It's a vampire. Yeah. And then in December, December 4th, we have Professor Beth Holmgren from Duke University who will be talking to us about the sexual revolution in 1920s Poland and Russia. And that one is gonna be a great one. And that's basically gonna close us off for the semester. We may have some more events in the spring, but if you're interested in the program, if you're interested in our study abroad for spring break to the Czech Republic, I've got some flyers over there and I'm happy to answer any questions. But let me just welcome you once more and I would like John Cuthbert to come and introduce our esteemed speaker this evening. Thank you. My name is John Cuthbert. I'm director of the WVU Libraries West Virginia and Regional History Center and I have the distinction of being able to introduce Denise because I've known her for several years and we also are her archives and all of her original manuscripts are stored with us along with those of many other West Virginia authors where researchers can come in and, and use them and, and will do so for the next several centuries at least I'm sure. Denise needs no introduction to many of you, uh, probably most of you even, as she's very well known to anybody that is a fan of West Virginia literature and a fan of West Virginia generally. Uh, a native of Bluefield, she grew up in a small coal camp in McDowell County, and I'm sure it's safe to say that her childhood experiences growing up in that environment left an indelible impression upon her and continues to influence her to this day. It's certainly reflected in her literature. <clears throat> She's a graduate of West Virginia Wesleyan College, and she also holds a Master's in Divinity from Virginia Theological Seminary. And after graduating from the seminary, rather than pursuing a, a career in the ministry, which I think was her, her original plan, she decided that writing was her true calling, and uh, I think history has certainly borne uh, out that that was a great decision. She's the author of five novels, among other works, including award-winning books, Storming Heaven and The Unquiet Earth, both historical fiction set in the Appalachian coal fields, and for which she is duly famous today. Also a devoted activist, a lifelong advocate of social justice, and candidate for governor on the Mountain Party ticket in the year 2000. Please join me in welcoming Denise Giardino. Thank you. I was listening to the list of the speakers that you've had are going to have, and a lot of them were about Russia. And I was thinking, now where do I fit into this? Uh, and I was remembering my childhood growing up in McDowell County, and uh, which is how we say it, by the way. And uh, there was a fellow that lived in a house up on the hill, and he lived all by himself, and nobody really saw much of him. And he painted the, he had several trees in his yard, and he painted the this, this bottom parts of them white all around. 
And we kids couldn't figure out what was going on. We decided, this isn't back in the 60s and the Cuban Missile Crisis and all that. We decided he was sending some kind of satellite signal to the Russians. <laughs> so, so we stayed away from that house. So that's my Russian connection. <laughs> uh, back in, in 1982, um, I was uh, hired by Ken Heckler, who was then just elected as Secretary of State. Mr. Ken Heckler, as you know, passed away recently. Uh, one of our great uh, public servants uh, and quite a story himself. Um, and I was hired um, because this is 1982, remember? We were talking about this with a group of students earlier. Uh, uh, and we were talking about how I wrote a lot of my novels in longhand. And I said, well, we didn't have anything else. and. Um, so when I took this job, actually it was 84, I apologize, it was 84, um, and all the, the offices in the State House that year, had just computers had been brought in, which nobody had ever seen before, uh, including me, and everybody just came in and kind of looked at them, I'm like, what do they do? And so for our office, they told us that, uh, that we could set up a database where anybody that filed for office would put them in there with their address and phone and contact information and blah 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 party and and then we could print out letters and send them to them and everybody's like what, what are we? so anyway I was the youngest and so they decided I was the one that should get this job and so that was my job for six months trying to figure out you know, totally computer illiterate and anybody who knows me now knows that I still pretty much am but somehow I, after six months of trying, I managed to set up a database that would do that. And they used it for 10 years. It's one of my proudest accomplishments. <laughs> but in addition to that job, I also was sent out from time to time for clerical work. And um, uh, one time we, we went to a little town called Gilbert down in Mingo County. Anybody here from Mingo County? Mingo County is in here? Well, it's down in the very southernmost part of the state, down uh, on the border with Kentucky. Uh, and. Um, there had been a, a mayor's uh, race that there had been some hanky-panky going on. And so they had asked the Secretary of State's office to come down and investigate. So we went down and I was supposed to do clerical work and just take notes. And during the break I was sitting on a bench and, and there was a fellow sitting next to me and he was the what you would call a stereotypical Mingo County or Southern West Virginian. Uh, he was an elderly man. He was wearing overalls and a plaid shirt and brogans. And so we sat there and we struck a, up a conversation. And he was asking me what I was doing. I was explaining a little bit. He was supposed to testify later on. And I can't remember how we got to this point in the conversation, but he said, isn't it awful the way they're treating that Nelson, Nelson Mandela over in South Africa? And I was like, and I had, I had heard of Nelson Mandela. This is back when Nelson Mandela was still in prison, actually. And I'd heard of him, but I didn't know, I knew he was from South Africa, but I didn't know a lot. I knew he'd gotten in trouble because he opposed apartheid, and that's all I knew. And, I, and he kept on, he said, they've got him in this prison, and they've got him on this strict diet, and he's doing hard labor, and they're going to be in there for so many years, and they're just treating him terrible, and they're treating those, those people terrible. And after a while, I said, how do you know this? And he said, I read it in the UMWA journal. And that sat me up straight because I don't think I would have heard that today. And I want to talk about where we are today and how we got from that point and even earlier. Uh, because that point in 1984 and that gentleman uh, uh, don't exist anymore. I thought about this and I started thinking about my own life and how it's changed. Because I'm going to be talking about how the state has changed, how the country has changed, and first of all, how I've changed. We have stages in our life, and I'm in the last stage of mine. Uh, I don't know how long it'll last. Um, but I, I see three acts, like a lot of plays maybe. Um, first act started in 1951 and went to 1980, and I was just me. I was not a writer. Uh, my biggest accomplishment was graduating from college, and I played the piano. And I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. Uh, and that was the first act. The second act started in 1980 when I began to write. And so for the next, up until the 2000s through that, I was a writer and an activist. And I lived a totally different life. I was uh, on my own. Uh, I was not living at home anymore. I was working odd jobs. I was getting myself in trouble speaking out about different issues. And I produced several novels. 
And that was that part of my life. By the mid-2000s, 2009, in fact, was the last novel that I published. Um, since then, I, I really haven't been a writer. I've written some short things. I've tried to start two books and haven't gotten very far. Uh, I've retired. I've started to become a lap swimmer, and that's the one of the most important things to me. Uh, I'm not nearly as activist as I used to be, uh, and I, I think I'm getting old. <laughs> so here I am, I'm 65 years old, and, and I'm looking at the next chapter of my life and thinking, is it, what's going to happen? Is it going to be different? Is something new going to happen? And I don't know the answer to that. And I look at the country and I see the same pattern in my lifetime. I look, go back to 1951 through 1980, and I see a liberal America, generally. Now, by liberal America, I don't want to sugarcoat that, because in that part of my life, in that part of the country's life, we had the Vietnam War. I don't know if any of you had a chance to see Ken Burns' documentary, part of it all or all of it, but it was a very, did a very good job of, of showing that time period. Um, and, and so, you know, we had the Vietnam War when those of you young men sitting here, as I can see, um, uh, if you flunked out of, school here, uh, or took a break from school here, like uh, Tom Bennett, who was a, a student here who flunked out, um, uh, and who the Bennett Tower is named after, um, you would end up in Vietnam. You, would, you wouldn't have a chance to say, oh, I'm going to take a year off from school and I'm going to go work at McDonald's or whatever, I'm going to go work for my uncle or whatever. You would end up in Vietnam. Uh, and so that was a hard time. It was a time of racism and segregation. I grew up in segregated schools. I grew up in a time when black people had to sit in the back of a movie theater. I grew up in a time when many restaurants wouldn't serve black people. Uh, so it was not a good time in many ways. It was a time when women, in many places, women could not eat alone in restaurants. There were restaurants in Charleston, West Virginia that wouldn't treat a single woman. You had to be with a man. Women couldn't get credit cards. My mother couldn't get a credit card. I couldn't get a credit card until I was almost 30 years old. Women couldn't buy houses. In 1974, we finally got an act that nobody's ever heard of now. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act passed by Congress, which finally allowed women to have credit cards of their own and buy houses on their own. 1974. But still, with all those inequalities, and all those problems, there was a sense that we were growing beyond and would keep progressing. There was still an, a sense of idealism that was projected by people like John F. Kennedy and, and Lyndon Johnson uh, and, uh, and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King, and who, who projected a vision for us of where this country was going and where it could keep going. It was also a time when people had pensions from employers that they expected to keep for their lifetimes, and they had health care from their employers, which they expected to keep for their lifetimes. It was a time when public colleges were actually funded by the government and didn't have to go ha getting handouts from private foundations and scrabbling for money and raising tuition. It was a time when, pe when parents had stable enough jobs that they could save for college for their kids. And if they couldn't save for college for their kids, their kids could work jobs on campus, like working in the kitchen or working in the post office or working at the switchboard, which we don't have anymore, uh, working in the library. And you could make enough money at those part-time jobs on your campus to avoid going into debt so that when you graduated from college, you had no debt. It was a time when if you were a high school graduate and you didn't want to go to college, you could get a job that paid well and left you with a pension and medical care. 1981 is the beginning of the end of all that. And, and I'm going to name some names here. Um, and it might step on some toes, those of you who admire these people. Uh, Ronald Reagan, Rupert Murdoch, and Don Blankenship. If I was going to start pointing fingers, those are the three fingers I would point the most. Two of them nationally, one of them locally. Reagan's trickle-down economics and union busting led us to what Bernie Sanders today calls the 1%. It led us to incredible tax cuts for the rich, which were supposed to trickle down and help everybody else, but in fact, which 
which made the, the, the demise of all the, the public education and, and pensions and health care and all those things that, that I was talking about earlier. Um, we had Rupert Murdoch delivering propaganda and the fairness doctrine, which used to require the media to, to if, if there was an extreme position posted, they had to, to give the opposing view, give somebody else a chance to make another case on the opposite side. That was taken down, and so there was no, so when Fox News, as, after it appeared, uh, began posting the kinds of things they were posting, there was no liberal response or no response from the other side, uh, unless you started another network on your own. And then there was Don Blankenship's destruction of the United Mine Workers, which had been a strong force in this state for keeping miners not only safer, but for providing them with pensions and providing them with health care. And as, as you may know now, uh, our Senators Manchin and Capito are fighting on Capitol Hill so that those miners who worked in the mines for decades and were promised those pensions and promised those health care, that health care, um, that they can still keep that. Because unless Congress acts, and I'm afraid they might not, those people my age and older who were coal miners are going to—they're—they're they're out. That's it. They have nothing except so social security. And that that kind kind of uh, action began back in the 80s and continued for the next several decades. And that leads uh, uh, to today. Then where we are today? And where are we today? Um, Donald Trump. Um, and West Virginia switching from one of the bluest states in the country throughout much of my life, one of the bluest states in the country to one of the reddest states in the country now. And how did that happen and what's, where is it going to take us? Um, well, I tried to look back further back and to look at where West Virginia has been throughout uh, the last two centuries, um, 20th and 21st century. And, um, um, and I came across uh, something, I recently had an essay published that, uh, that was written about my father. And here's, what I, here's one paragraph I wrote, my father came of age in t rough times. Much of the country was booming after the war, this is World War I, uh, spending freely and partying despite prohibition, this is the 1920s, as oblivious to the coming depression as a late night carouser aboard the Titanic. So the, the, the country was in great shape, it thought. But not so in West Virginia, which has never been in sync with whatever time in which it exists. And that's the point I want to make. West, West Virginia has never been in sync with the time in which it exists. And, and here, here's, um, here's the way that broke down as I kind of look back. 1920s, uh, the country was prospering. Socialism was tanking, and in West Virginia, West Virginia was suffering. The miners union had been broken after the Battle of Blair Mountain. Uh, wages were low, safety conditions were poor. Mine explosions claimed hundreds and thousands of lives. So you had a, a happy country and a sad state, let's put it that way. 1930s, the country fell into a great depression. But thanks to uh, Franklin Roosevelt, West Virginia's unionization came back uh, and the state became almost totally unionized and John L. Lewis took over and built the union up even more and employment was up and, and payment was up. You know, people's wages finally began to, be, they fi miners finally began to make decent wages. So the country was suffering and West Virginia was having a better time. <laughs> See what I mean? Then we're out of sync. Um, the 1940s. The country was at war, a terrible war, World War II, and West Virginia's mines were booming. 1950s and 1960s, the country was growing prosperous and uh, growing in prosperity and influence, and in West Virginia, mines were shutting down and coal camps were being torn down as the mines were mechanized and more and more people lost their jobs and, their, and, and had, were forced to move out, including my own family. 1970s, the country was suffering an energy crisis in which gas prices skyrocketed because, because of OPEC and, 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 and the scarcity of oil. And West Virginia's mines were booming again. The 1980s, Reagan and Blankenship became active in West Virginia, but West Virginia was still a solidly blue state. In 1988, 
10 states voted for Michael Dukakis over George W. Bush, and West Virginia was one of those states. And today, West Virginia voted for Donald Trump in greater numbers than any other state in the union. So do you see what I'm saying? We're like, whenever the country's been here, we've been over here. And when we've been over here, the country's been over here. We've, so it's, it's hard to judge where we are in terms of where the country is sometimes. We are our own unique place in many ways. Uh, but I, I, one thing I'm sure of is I look back over this scenario and I think about that, that, that retired coal miner in, that, in the overalls in Gilbert, West Virginia talking about Nelson Mandela because he read it in the United Mine Workers Journal I guarantee you his son is not reading the United Mine Workers Journal because the UMWA is, is just a, a, is a ghost of itself here in West Virginia. Uh, his son is watching Fox News and that's where he's learning about things. And he would not have learned about a Nelson Mandela. Well, when I look, look again back over the history uh, and look specifically about what I'm supposed to be talking about, which is, I guess, revolution or socialism, um, uh, and, and I think, and I did a lot of research on this for Storming Heaven, um, and I learned a number of things. I, I learned I didn't know how how uh, broadly socialism had been accepted in West Virginia, but um, it was. Um, and, and West Virginia, in the early decades of the, of the 20th century, uh, there was a socialist newspaper published in Huntington, West Virginia, and tens of thousands of miners subscribed to it. And during some of the big strikes at the time, uh, the state raided post offices in those regions and confiscated copies of those newspapers uh, because the First Amendment basically did not mean anything in those days, uh, especially in places like West Virginia. Uh, that's why we have organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, they were formed to fight the fact that the First Amendment had no no influence at all in places like West Virginia in those days. Um, in 1913, the state of West Virginia invaded the presses of that newspaper and destroyed the presses of that newspaper. In West Virginia, many people voted for Eugene Debs, who was a socialist candidate for, governor, for uh, president back in those days. And I have, I have a trivia question for you. And this is more than, um, where do, you, where do you think was the longest running socialist municipal government in the country? The longest running socialist municipal government in the country. Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody know? Wheeling? Nope. Star City. Star City, West Virginia. I didn't know this till last week. I was doing some research for this paper, or for, for this speech. Um, from like the early, from around 1912 until into the 1920s. Uh, there was a brief uh, year when, when some conservatives kind of ousted them and then people were so upset about what the conservatives were doing that they, they quickly got rid of them. <laughs> so uh, so for, about ten, for a period of over 10 years, Star City was governed by socialists. And, and, I, and I find that confusing then, again, when I think about where we are. And this, you know, here we are in a state that voted for Donald Trump and um, and that was our history. Uh, and it's, you know, I've been talking to some students and professors today, and it's, it's so much more complex than a lot of people realize, uh, and, and that many of us realize, and that pe certainly people outside the state realize. Um, and I was thinking about my own childhood experiences growing up at a coal camp. Um, I lived in a coal camp house as a child that was owned by the company. My father didn't own that house. It sat on land owned by Pocahontas uh, land company, which was a wholly owned subsidiary of Norfolk and Southern Railroad. So they owned the land. So you couldn't build anything on that land. They owned not only our coal camp, they owned a third of McDowell County and a number of other companies, including Georgia Pacific, which is now owned by the Koch brothers, owned most of the rest of the county. So over 80% of the land was owned by corporations. You could not build anything on that land without a comp but the, those companies say so. And if they decided they wanted it for something else, they could tell you to tear it down. They tore down whole coal camps just because they wanted the land the coal camps sat on. We couldn't paint our house the color we wanted because the coal company decided what the color to paint the house. So our house was the most ugly color of yellow that you can imagine, and I, was like, I hated looking at it. <laughs> 
In McDowell County, the elections were rigged. In those days, they were rigged in favor of the Democratic Party, but rigged nevertheless. And uh, you know, if you were, my mother was a Republican from Eastern Kentucky. She had to change her registration in order to get a job as a public health nurse for, with, for Magdow County because they would only hire Democrats. And I thought about this. I thought, we don't own our land. We don't own our house. Our elections are rigged. How's this different from Russia? Because <laughs> I've been taught about Russia. That, you know, they live on collective farms. They make them live on collective farms. They don't own their land. They don't own their houses. You know, and they only have one party, which is the Communist Party, and that's who runs things. And I'm like, that sounds like McDowell County to me. <laughs> so I was confused. <laughs> and I was confused about, and I still am sometimes, about capitalism and communism. It's like, um, I'm supposed to be a good capitalist because I'm an American, uh, and I'm not supposed to like communism because that's about you know, all the land and, all, and everything is controlled by one entity. And yet if you go to McDowell County today and you're a good capitalist and you want to build a business, you can't do it. You can't do it because you can't get any land to put something on. It's not because there are mountains there. If you go to Asheville, North Carolina, there are mountains all over the place with businesses all over them. But in McDowell County, you don't have any land to build on because you don't own the land. So I, I moved back to McDowell County for a year after I graduated from seminary and um, I was still thinking about that question of do I go into the ministry or, or do I be a writer and, um, and I got involved with something called the Appalachian Land Ownership Study uh, and this was a group of people that was sponsored by the Appalachian Regional Commission uh, and also sponsored by Appalachian State University which provided our, the technical support for it um, and we were charged with uh, choosing a county, and mine was McDowell, uh, and going to the county courthouse and going to the land books and making a survey of who owned what and how much they owned and how much taxes they were paying. And that's when I found out, I was the person and the, the people that were helping me who found out that, that 80 some percent of the land was owned by these outside corporations. And that uh, Pocahontas Land Company, which owned a third of the county, was paying enough money in property taxes to buy one school bus for that county. And that was it. So uh, that really, you know, learning about that and then delving into the history of how that happened and how that land was basically stolen uh, led me to the writing of Storming Heaven and the Unquiet Earth and trying to explain to people why we were a poor state but there was a reason for that, and it wasn't because what the national media was telling us at the time, which was that we were supposed to be, we were backward and stupid and ignorant, uh, but that, in fact, but there were structural reasons for it, that we were a colony, that we were a, a wholly owned colony of the coal industry. Communities were destroyed throughout my lifetime, not just recently, there's all this talk about the war on coal and now in the last couple of days we're, we're being told, oh, the war on coal is over now. You know, Trump is rolling back all these, these uh, EPA things and so the war on coal is over. There was never a war on coal, but for decades, since my childhood, coal has been warring on West Virginia. Our communities, it's, it's ironic, uh, I, I'll say that. The coal industry giveth, the coal industry built these communities, and the coal industry taketh away. Coal itself has destroyed what it built. Mechanization, first of all, which cost many, many jobs. Union busting, starting with the Don Blankenship days, cost many, many jobs and many, uh, many uh, uh, people had to leave. Um, Here's my personal family experience. My father was a bookkeeper for the coal company and uh, the house we lived in that I told you about was not our house. But when I was 12 years old, the coal company said, we're gonna start selling all these houses to the miners. We're not gonna own them anymore. We're gonna let you own your own house, the American dream. And at that time, a lot of people were leaving because they were laying people off. And one of the people leaving was the, was the camp doctor. And the doctor lived in a big house, 10 room house. And they said to my dad, we'll sell you this house. And he was like, okay, that's a nice house, you know. And so he bought the house, first house he'd ever owned. We moved in. Three months later, they laid him off. So now we had a house that we just bought that we were in debt for, and my father had no job. 
And that is how the coal industry has treated people in West Virginia. So now, you know, where are we today? Um, you know, politics has changed. We used to have people, and these names for you younger folks won't be familiar to you, but we had people in the legislature like Paul Kaufman, Cy Galperin, Ken Heckler, who were progressive. We had one of the most progressive legislatures in the country in the 1960s. They came within one vote, by the way, one vote in the legislature of abolishing strip mining. They abolished the death penalty. Now, we have, in 2012, over 40% of Democratic voters voted for a convict over President Obama. And then, as I said, we, we voted for Trump in larger numbers in 2016 than any state. Now, by the way, we have rampant drug abuse. And I see a connection between these two because as our economy has gone downhill, we have continued to, to look for answers and seen no answers, but we continue to buy into what I think is a, this is a brilliant, a brilliant campaign, which whoever created it, I don't know who did, but um, the coal industry should certainly pat them on the back. Um, uh, Friends of Coal, which has led you know, many, many West Virginians, as the coal industry has tanked, to identify with their abusers. You know, people who are being exploited, who are identifying with their exploiters. So it seems, to me, it seems the situation today, we are, we are like people with Stockholm Syndrome. We are so connected to and identifying with those who are treating us terribly that we cannot stand up against them. And that's a, a really sad situation to be in. Um, and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, the industry is dying. It's going to keep on dying. And those of you who are young, it will die in your lifetime, I think, in this, in, in, for the most part. Now, it's not going to totally disappear. But, but it's also it's like the, the, you know, the monster movies where they keep shooting at the monster and finally it's mortally wounded, you know, smog or whatever, you know, and, and it starts thrashing around and just beating everything to death with its tail, you know, and destroying everything. And, and that's the way the, the, the coal industry is going down. It's trying to take us with it. But, you know, I sound like Debbie Downer here, but, um, <laughs> but um, you know, here's what I wrote at the end of The Unquiet Earth, uh, which it, it's based on the Buffalo Creek flood, uh, and I moved it up a little bit later. Um, but, so this whole hollow has been destroyed at the end of Unquiet Earth. And I wrote that, and I wrote it when I was out of state, living out of state, and thinking I might not go back to West Virginia. And I have the character write, I can no more go back than I could dig up a corpse and blow life into it. But I did come back, and I'm here. So let me read you another section from The Unquiet Earth. Um, it's the sports section. Um, this, is, this is Jackie when she's a little girl. So she's like seven years old. So she's speaking like a little girl. So. We watch West Virginia play California in basketball. Dylan says it is for the national championship. Little gray men in shorts run back and forth. The TV voice says, Jerry West, Jerry West, Jerry West. The basketball falls through the net like water splashing and the ball is gone from the face of the earth and that it is there again and they grab it and run with it. Uncle Brigham's wife Betty makes popcorn and me and Uncle Brigham's two kids eat it all up so she pops some more. Jerry West, the voice yells. But West Virginia loses the national championship by one point and Uncle Brigham cusses and Uncle Brigham's boy Dole Ray cries until Uncle Brigham shames him out of it. Dole Ray, uh, Dylan sits back like he is satisfied and not a bit surprised. I know what he is thinking about losers, how he once said, a loser knows things about this world that a winner will never know and is better for it. That's why I'm still here. That's why we lost to TCU. <laughs> That's why we lost in the Final Four. That's why California beat us in the national championship. We're losers. 
But if socialist revolutions are dead and lost, and maybe they aren't given the success of Bernie Sanders with young people, if the American empire is going down the tubes, and like all empires, it is. It is, and it will. I'd rather be a loser here in West Virginia from this vantage point. So I'm here, and I hope you all stay here too. Thanks. Take questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just see if there are any questions. Just a few questions, maybe. I rambled all over the place there a little bit. I'm sorry. You were negative at How did you I ran in 2000 basically just to call attention to mountaintop removal because I knew neither the Democrat or the Republican were going to do it. Uh, so, um, uh, that's why I ran. I was hoping to get into some TV debates and maybe talk about it. And um, uh, partially worked. I was on a, you know one TV debate, but the, the other one wouldn't let me on. But um, but it did. Um, it raised the issue, I think, nationally and even internationally in a way that it hadn't been before. Because there were several. Uh, CNN came and did talk to me and did a, a segment on on. Um, mountaintop removal, and uh, it was even shown in Europe. I had a friend of mine was. Um, in Spain, and, and her cab driver asked where she was from, and she said, oh, well, she said West Virginia, he said, oh, I saw the woman um, with a dog. She, I had a dog at the time who did campaigning with me. He said, I saw a woman with a dog on TV. <laughs> but uh, the Washington Post did an article on it, and the Economist in Great Britain did an article on it. So I think that was the first maybe international exposure about the issue. So it did do a little bit that way, but uh, uh, you know, that's, third party runs are not going to win elections in this country, basically. So. Uh, you made the point about when coal is a valuable commodity in West Virginia that has done well, when the nation has suffered and needed the energy. Uh, so that's sort of how we waxed and waned. And, uh, influence of the union uh, has also waxed and waned and, mm -hmm. and currently the union is doesn't have the power that it once had and I wonder if you equate the the power of the union with our left or right leaning in politics mm -hmm. in other words we're more conservative in the state than we have ever been maybe and Perhaps the unions are uh, 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 you know, less strong than they've been in the past. I think that that's true. I think I really think if the if the union and there are many reasons why it's not, but if the union was as strong today as it had been in the '70s, for example, um, uh, you would not have a Donald Trump winning the, uh, in West Virginia. Um, and um, uh, that's just, the union has always, that, that's my point about the Nelson Mandela story, is that the union's always been a force, not just for helping minors, but to educate minors and, and, and to connect with social movements in other countries, and, uh, um, and you just don't have anything like that now. Um, um, and it's partly because, it's partly because Don Blankenship was so good at busting the union, at so many minds, taking over minds, and, he would take over a mine, he would fire the union miners and bring in non-union miners. That's just the way he operated, including the mine that my dad worked at uh, before he retired. And, uh, um, uh, but now it's, it's even more than that. And it's not just that, there's, that the gas is taking the market for coal and that coal is losing out on the market share. It's that if by some miracle, and it's not going to happen, but if by some miracle that became a demand for coal again all of a sudden, you're not going to see thousands of miners being hired and going back to work and working underground. You're going to be digging that coal with robots. Okay? It's going to be like the automobile assembly lines. You're not, it's not going to be, it's going to be a different version of the mechanization that happened back in the 50s and 60s. Um, it's going to be even more sophisticated. 
and I don't think that's going to happen because I don't think they're going to want to invest in that when there's, the market is not going to bear out that kind of investment. But I think that's what you would see uh, is something like that. That's why you have mountaintop removal because it's mostly machines and very many human, you know, very few human beings working those jobs. So that trend is going to continue, and as long as that continues, there's no, again, there's no counterforce. The union has always been the counterforce to, to that kind of right-wing kind of control, and, and the union was the reason we had all those liberal legislators back in the 60s, um, uh, but you don't have them now because you don't have a union supporting them, and you don't have a membership that's supporting them. And, um, and so we've got to figure out something else, some other way um, to bring, and I'm, I'm, and I'm going to be, uh, let me stop here and say, I know I'm sounding maybe a little bit one-sided because I'm talking about liberals versus conservatives, and I have some conservative views myself. Um, so it's not that clear cut, um, and, but uh, I think if you're talking about what I see is progressive views versus corporate views. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Um, uh, and by corporate views, I don't mean the mom and pop grocery. I don't mean the business that could locate in McDowell County and start a you know, business person who could go start a small business in McDowell County uh, or even a medium-sized business in McDowell County. I'm, calling, I'm talking about these massive multinational corporations that have absolutely no controls on them you know, and what little they have is what we're still trying to hold on to by our fingernails. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's the future that I think we need to uh, uh, fight out. Um, um, that's why I think Bernie Sanders was so appealing to many younger people because you know, he may not have all the answers, and I don't think he does, uh, but he was putting his finger on something important, which is that this power is getting away from us, uh, and we somehow need to put the brakes on it. And, um, um, I think that's going to be for the younger generations to figure out how to do that. So you ended by talking about losing. <laughs> and in my foray into local politics, I am finding a somewhat defeatist attitude. That is, it can't be done here. Are you... I don't think that's what you're saying at the end of your talk there, but where does that attitude come from and does it need to be overcome before we as a state can become more self-empowered? Yeah, I think it does. And, I, and that isn't, that's not what I was saying and I was a little worried that it might come across that way. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not saying it can't be done here. I, 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 in fact, and I look at other places where it has been done. I look at just to the north of Pittsburgh, which was in the same shape we were in with when they lost the steel industry. And they did something about it. Uh, and I think we can do something about it too. It's not that it can't be done. Um, but I guess I was trying to make a larger point that um, not to devalue ourselves because we're somehow, we, we, we don't run everything. Um, and maybe I'm, I'll be a little bit religious here. As a Christian, um, you know, Jesus Christ was the ultimate failure. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the ultimate failure. Yeah, you know, the ultimate loser. Seriously, uh, and that's what he did. He lost, and um, and so when we lose, you know, that's to me. That's where we should identify and say, look, uh, um, there's more to life than winning. In fact, you know, the, Donald Trump is a winner. You know, <laughs> on paper. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm a loser. Spiritually. Yeah. Well, that's the point. Spiritually, uh, you know, um, I think what the character was saying uh, is that there's something about losing that teaches you uh, something spiritual. I guess that's a good way to put it. Um, I don't know how many of you play sports, but if you play sports and you win every game all the time, all the time, um, you know, you become the New England Patriots. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you know what I'm saying. You, if you win all the time, all the time, it's like, okay, that's fine. But the people that learn the lessons from playing sports are the ones that lose some games. You know? And there's something about losing those games that teaches you something. 
So that's what I'm saying. And so to look at where we are now, look at all the bad things that happen here and all the bad things we're going through, let's take those things and learn something from them and grow from them. That's what I'm saying. And maybe I should have said that in the speech itself rather than now, but I said it now. So that's, that's why I like to take questions because I can say things that I should have said in the speech. So, yeah. I think it's totally up to each individual. I mean, to know your own heart and to know your own talents and to know what you want to uh, do. I think I think one question you're asking is, do I do what I want to do or do I do what my parents want me to do? Or do I do what I want to do or do I do what the school was saying? Oh, this, this is actually, there is a lot of pressure, I think, for students right now, college students. That, the governor of Kentucky wants colleges to do with, away with Pro, any program that doesn't lead directly to a good paying job, do away with it, you know. Um, with, you know, so, you know, and people that have that attitude, there are a lot of them out there, uh, you know, think there shouldn't be any liberal arts. You know, there shouldn't be, uh, it, should, it should just be, you know, yeah. and I know there's probably some computer people here, including my, my nephew, but computers, 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 and that pays, that's fine, but what do you put in those computers? You know, it's nice to know Shakespeare so that you know the, the content. It's nice to, um, to do tech stuff, but a lot of the tech people I look at and hear and listen, and listen to them and read what they're saying, they're very literate people. <laughs> they're, they're not dummies. I mean, they're, they're not uneducated. They know, they know the classics. And, um, uh, so uh, I think, and again, this is a generational thing too. I had this luxury that I think a lot of you don't have. I had the luxury when I went to college that my, fa my father, who was a middle class person, but, um, but didn't have a lot of the expenses and, and had, he, he didn't have to worry about saving, he didn't have to worry about a 401k and putting money into his 401k so he'd have something to retire on because his company had a pension for him, which most companies don't now. Uh, but, so I had that luxury that he could take that money and save it for my college. Uh, and I was also lucky enough to get a, a scholarship, which helped too, but um, uh, I basically could go to college and say, I'm just going to major in history because I love history. I don't know what I'm going to do with it when I graduate, um, but that's what I'm going to major in. Now, <laughs> this is another irony. Those of you who are, you know, the, I always see, you know, baby boomers talking about millennials, like, oh, they're still living in their parents' basement, you know, after they're, you know, they're 25 years old, 26 years old, still living in their parents' basement, and that was me. <laughs> I was 30 years old before you know, I figured out what I was going to do. So the, from the time I graduated from college until the time I was 30 years old, I mainly did typing jobs. Uh, I mean, the, that was the, the, big, the class that was the most valuable to me, both, you know, in terms of earning and living, was the typing class I took in 12th grade. So, <laughs> So, um, but I'm, I'm still, I'm glad I didn't, you know, I thought about going to law school and then I took the LSAT and I thought, that is so boring. I am not going to spend three years of my life studying that stuff. So I didn't become a lawyer and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, my mom was like, you always start things and don't finish them. You know? And, and um, I was like, yeah. but I don't have any regrets about that because I loved history and I took history and I continued to read history and learn and I knew how to research. And so when finally I figured things out, I knew how to go to the archives and start researching and write some books about it then. And uh, um, I don't like the idea of cookie cutter. I know that's easy to say if, you, if you're worried about paycheck to paycheck and where your groceries are coming from. Um, but if at all you can do, just follow your heart and don't worry about, you know, dad says you need to be a lawyer or, or, or 
you know, the newspaper says you need to major in, you know, high tech stuff and not take poetry or whatever. Um, just do what you want to do. You're only here for a few years, so take the classes you want to take. You're, you know, whatever electives that you have, you know, you have to take some classes. I assume they still require some classes, but whatever electives you have, look at what's available and pick the one that sounds the best to you. Don't worry about whether or not it's going to bring any money into you. Because actually, 15 years from now, that might be the, the class that <laughs> brings in the money. <laughs> I mean, you don't know. But, you know you're going to change jobs and, and courses probably several times in your life. And you don't know what direction is going to be the most valuable. So, for what it's worth. Yeah. So this might be a tough question. But while you're here, I'd like to try to get some of your wisdom on the matter. Uh, what would you say to young Western people that's worried about the future of being of Western The future of what? Like the fate of Western well, I, 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 think, I, I think it is up in the air. I mean, that's why I, I sort of, when I talked about my own life, it's like, where does it go from here? Um, I don't know. I could live to be 85, or, or I had cancer two years ago, so I could, you know, we, cancer could come back and I could be gone in a few years. Uh, this state um, could really go down the tubes. But, I mean, it's already going down the tubes. It could keep going down the tubes bad, badly, badly, badly. Or something can happen in the next couple of years that might flip things around totally, and, and we'll be like, "Yeah, why you know why didn't we think of that before?" Or, or um, you know, we could. I don't know. I'd like to look closer at what happened in Pittsburgh to see uh, how they t went from totally going down the tubes, losing the steel industry, to flipping it around to be now a really vibrant city. And it takes some political leadership, I think, is um, part of the problem. I think we were, you know, I heard about the flip in Morgantown, and um, you know, that's hopeful to me, I think, to get some visionaries in place who are gonna say, you know, we can't just keep looking at the past and going, oh, you know, we gotta bring back coal, we gotta bring back coal, we gotta bring back coal, it's like, no. Um, you know, time moves forward. Not, you know, I'm not a predictor of the future, so I don't know what. I, I do know that it will help more if people can stay here. Although I also recommend, I don't want that to sound like I left for 10 years, and, and I also recommend doing that for a few years. I think living in, I lived in Washington D.C. for five years, and I lived in North Carolina for three years, and those were good experiences. And uh, I, I recommend going out of state for a few years. You know, pick some place different. Um, uh, but um, hope, but don't ever forget your connection here. So whether it's coming back to live, or whether it's whatever you do out there in the world that uh, you know, if you're out in California creating high tech stuff, you know, maybe think about coming back to West Virginia at some point and starting up a start up here, even though you don't live here anymore. I mean, just but to keep a connection with the place, um, and that you know could help. I think we do have. Um, there's an opportunity here for individuals that sometimes it's easy to get lost in the world out there. And this place, you can make such a difference. Just, uh, it's a small enough place. It's a small enough place that I could, you know, I shook hands with the president of the university tonight. Um, uh, I used to know the governor of West Virginia real well. I don't know the new guy, but uh, I've known a number of governors. I'm just a person. I mean, you know, I know the mayor of Charleston, and uh, you know, I, I, in other words, I know people, it's small enough that I know people personally that I could call and say, hey, what's going on here? You know, call the editor of the Gazette and say, what's going on here? Um, I couldn't do that in North Carolina. I couldn't do that in Washington, D.C. And so um, that gives me hope, and I think the connectedness that people feel here gives me hope. Um, uh, if we can just... I really think the Stockholm Syndrome thing is, uh, if a person has been kidnapped, and we have been for decades, um, uh, to stop and say, you know, I'm going to a therapist. <laughs> and I'm going to realize that this guy that kidnapped me for all this time, he doesn't own me anymore. Yeah, and I'm saying bye. And so that's what we need to say. Anything else? Your point about County, in terms of the uh, three people or three interest groups owning most of the city land, uh, 
things they indicate. Uh, that kind of control breeds a kind of determinism that there's nothing you can do with it. Uh, you just because you're fucking against the impossible odds because there's no tax money, there's no uh, freedom to establish a business for them. It's that same attitude that we're finding with the, the gun control, that we as a nation have a kind of a, a, a defeatist attitude as far as our ability to, to take steps. I'm wondering what kinds of uh, priorities should we be looking at from your experience uh, in terms of the kinds of changes that we need to be making to uh, overcome this determinism that is, uh, is at the main ground floor on a lot of different things that go on in this um, it, it's a hard question. I, I'm in West Virginia still, but I'm not in Magdow County, uh, and I, I don't think I could go back there. It's really depressing. Um, and I, I think the only hope for places like Magdow County is um, the other parts of the state. And actually, you know, for much of the 20th century, most of the 20th century, the southern part of the state ruled and, and fueled the rest of the state. Uh, and fueled state government and so forth. And I think the reverse has to happen now. I think the northern part of the state, especially this area, the eastern panhandle, uh, Parkersburg, Wheeling, need to take over the direction of the state. And the only way places like McNeil County are gonna be helped is, is if those places grow and prosper and bring progressive issues and dynamics and progressive leadership as opposed to the bubbling idiots we've got in there now. <laughs> Uh, and that's the only way that uh, the southern part of the state is going to be revived. It's going to have to be a top-down thing this time. It's going to be north to south instead of south to north. If that makes any sense, that's just that's just my I don't know. That's just my thought. I mean, I'm not an expert, obviously. Uh, I'm a writer. <laughs> but, um, it, Yeah, the drug thing is, is a hard one for me because uh, it's fairly new. Um, it's not just West Virginia, it's not just Martinsburg, it's, it's not just, you know, McDowell County has a terrible drug problem. NBC News has been doing a series this week on Dayton, Ohio. They've got a terrible drug problem. Everybody's got a terrible drug problem. It's national, it's not, you know, New Hampshire has one of the worst drug problems in the country. Uh, so, so it's not just West Virginia, it's not just Martinsburg, and, and it's, uh, um, you know, I think we are starting to see some, some political leaders saying, look, we've got we've to look at this. Uh, I, and I don't have the answers because I don't know. Um, I understand uh, uh, part of the issue has been the drug industry itself, I think. You know, you can't turn on the TV news without watching you know, 10 drug commercials. And um, that's a fairly new thing, I think, the last few years. And, um, uh, and so somehow to start reining that back and say, look, and to talk to doctors about how they prescribe things and to look to alternatives for pain. Um, um, but, um, and some of it I think is a spiritual crisis in the sense of, I don't mean spiritual like God, like anything like that, but just um, there's something about modern life that, you know, uh, disconnects us sometimes from people. And so instead of wanting to get out and meet people, we just want to stare at the TV set or something, um, and um, there's a, you know, a lack of civic, or you know, a lot of civic organizations are kind of dying on the vine because there's just not a lot of participation anymore, so um, I, don't, I think it's a really complex issue, and, and I don't know what the answer is, but it's not just Martinsburg, and it's, it's, it's an American issue. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned like coal is in its death throes and you know, 
bringing back, like, coal's not coming back, and when it is not coming back, the coal unions aren't coming back. So that man in McDowell County who was reading a coal mining journal, like a union journal, that platform is not there to provide like a platform for progressive ideas. Do you have any recommendations for us young people for how to push for progressive ideas around the state? Um. Yeah, it's, you know that's another tough one. It, it's got, it's not, it's got to be looked for elsewhere. I think it's not that the, you know the UMWA journal still exists. It's just that there aren't many union members, and so there's not many people reading it anymore. Um, but there are plenty of you know places out there uh, to get ideas, and not just not, not just liberal, not just conservative, but thoughtful, whether it's liberal or conservative. Um, uh, you know, they've got the internet, and you've got plenty of. Um, um, of the press, despite you know the fake news thing, you know, you know pick up a, a magazine like the New Yorker, and you get an education. I mean, uh, um, so uh, to just seek out things to read, to 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 read a variety of magazines and newspapers, and and um, read on the internet, and um, and get your sources from a variety of places to not just one source, but um, um, and just try to stay off the 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 comment boards. <laughs> I get drawn into those sometimes and I, I get real mad and I'm like, I spend a half an hour reading these jerky comments and I'm like, oh my God, why did I just waste my half hour doing that? So um, try to avoid that. But um, but there, there are plenty of sources still out there. Um, anything else? Um, what do you think the future is for people who like People who want to be coal miners or are coal miners or whose families are coal miners who don't have the means to like get out of their communities or go to college or something for a further education. Mm -hmm. Like people talk about in politics all the time, like if we move towards renewable energy, like what are we going to do with the people in West Virginia who are coal miners who rely on us for a job? Like what do you think? Yeah, it's a tough, tough situation and, and when I talk about the Stockholm Syndrome or whatever, it's understandable what's going on, uh, because Try to put yourself in the place of a coal miner who's either lost a job or, or is going to. Um, you're living there in your house in Wyoming County or McDowell County or, or Raleigh County. Who's going to buy? Let's say people keep saying, oh, move somewhere else and get a job. Who's going to buy your house? Nobody's going to buy your house. Uh, if they are, they're going to pay you maybe $10,000 for it. So uh, you can't just pick up and move somewhere else in many cases. And what you do have in that coal mining community still is a, is a support network. You may have some relatives, you may have neighbors. Um, so it's not easy. And I have all the sympathy in the world for those people because I've been there with my, you know, with my dad losing his job. Um, but some of the most hopeful things I've seen, and I think one of the things that might end up being hopeful, uh, are retraining, there are organizations that are retraining minors for tech jobs. Uh, and uh, that's something you can do from anywhere, in many cases, although there are parts of West Virginia that don't have broadband, so that's an issue too. But um, um, uh, it's a tough, that's a tough one, you know, and um, it's not so simple as just all oh, move, you know, move to California and get a job or something. You can, it's not, people can't do that anymore easily. Um, so, um, but I think it's, it's a pipe dream. To th I think it doesn't help people just to give them hope that coal's coming back because I think that's not a reality. And it would uh, be more helpful, uh, and also to, to uh, it'd be more helpful to look for alternatives and also um, to emphasize education for younger people because uh, there's a mindset that's natural that, you know, when I get out of high school, I don't have to get any more training because there's a $60,000 mining job waiting for me. Well, you know, well, so I'll be making more than the teachers are making, which is, was true, and that was true for several decades, but that's not true anymore. And so to, to get younger kids to realize that, yes, you do have to pay attention in school. Yes, you need to uh, get some other kind of training. Um, and uh, the, you know, that's the starting point, but it's not easy. Anything? One more, one more question. Okay, guess this. Give, I guess, that's it. Well, 
Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, oh, uh, and, I, and thank you all. Uh, if, you internet, if you're interested in our future events, please uh, take a flyer. And uh, I hopefully some of you will leave here having been inspired to become a social activist, to go back to the community you came from, if you're from West Virginia, if you're from California, uh, and find a way to make a difference the way Denise has for us tonight. Thank you. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Denise.